scope of this movie is, is really is really huge because we're theoretically all over the world in huge, huge environments. We have a hundred sets in this movie. Without question, this will be the biggest puppet movie ever made. The people, the crew, the team doing this movie is unbelievable. I mean, between the Kyoto Brothers and I mean, every every single side of it. And Jim Doltz, who was brought in, you know, is basically a genius. Jim was the only guy who knew how to do anything. You know, and then we've all kind of learned and now it's kind of a team effort, but in the beginning, Jim was seriously the only guy who was like, okay, well, this is how you can do it. The role of a production designer is to read the script, do tons and tons of research. And then you come up with like a concept of the movie, you know, hitting, not just the look, but the moods of the movie and the metaphors. Matt Stone and Trey Parker wanted to do a parody of Bruckheimer films. Well, please, get down on the ground! They wanted to do a big, big action adventure. So we started with a very gritty Bruckheimer reality, but within that framework, um, it was open to a lot of theatricality. I was a huge fan of Matt and Trey's and South Park uh, and read the script and, and it was one of those things where I knew instantly that, that, uh, that of course I had to do the project and that this was a world that was inhabited by two foot tall marionettes that um, can do a few things but can't do a whole lot. So physically the environment had a chance to help tell the story. And, and that's what hooked me, is ultimately what I'm interested in is physical places that tell stories and connect uh, emotionally. Yeah. So it was a chance as a designer to really kind of affect the story in a way you don't get to really do in architecture. You don't get to do dancing, flying buildings often. Go ahead and let them, let them shake a lot like the Muppets as they're clapping. One of the things that Trey and Matt were clearest about is that the comedy is provided by the marionettes. Ooh, good shot. So the, the environment is not there to tell a joke. The environment is there to create this believable world. At the same time, we wanted to create very different worlds. What we came up with was that every place in the world was the way America sees the world. So this isn't really Cairo. This is kind of the dumbed down version of what Americans might think Cairo is. Same with Paris, same with Panama, and every city that we're attacking. Well, Paris was the first set we designed, and in some ways it was the most challenging because it was so big and it was so recognizable. And what we thought would be interesting is to take all of the monuments you recognize in Paris and put them in one little plaza. So the Eiffel Tower, the Arc de Triomphe, the Louvre, and the Paris Opera House all exist on this quaint plaza with a, a paving pattern made out of cast croissants with little poodle topiaries. It's a combination of what real Paris looks like and the people who've only been to Epcot might imagine Paris looks like. Trey had the notion of how he was going to open the movie early on, starting in sort of foreground and then expanding this big view. So when it got to the big view, we wanted a huge payoff, a huge horizon. One of the things that Jim Daltz and David Rockwell came up with um, is the idea of forced perspective in a lot of our sets, because you'll see a lot of big, expansive sets in this movie, in the exteriors especially, where it gives the illusion it goes back hundreds and hundreds of feet. We don't have that kind of room on our soundstage, so what we do is we, we create in our roughly one-third scale, which is uh, our marionette scale, we build everything very exactly and very precisely. We build it as best as we can. But in the next scale back, in our forced perspective, if you take, an, take a 12-inch action figure and put that 10 feet behind this guy and make the sets reduce in size as they get further back, it gives the illusion of a lot greater depth. And we found that you can get away with quite a lot because it's generally soft focus. It's behind the action, so people aren't necessarily paying attention to it. And so, you know, we can literally print out a picture from the internet, cut it out on cardboard, and stick it on the puppet, on the 12-inch puppet, and that becomes a prop that reads just fine in the background. And look. Dust.
the same kind of reductivist view that went into Paris, went into Cairo. And we've got reset, please. And it was a chance to go into a totally new world. Tons of research on graphics and um, creating a very real, dangerous feeling world. And in the marketplace, the design strategy was capture the sort of color of the market, capture the messiness of the market, capture the diversity of the market, all with hard light coming from above. And then you go from the marketplace into these claustrophobic corridors that lead you to other rooms. And they lead you to this bar that's the terrorist hangout. So it needed to feel dark, it needed to feel dangerous. So the bar face is made out of toxic waste cans. There are curtains made out of coins. In the distance, you see palm trees that look very real, but when you get closer, made out of ripped dollar bills. David Rockwell's input was, um, was really noticing the found objects. As far as found objects go, I was going through um, a restaurant supply place and found a colander, and from that colander, we added an umbrella that we'd ripped the skin off of, and then a baby nipple, and it became a satellite dish, which nobody will see, but it gave me a laugh. And these are our cheese graters. It's actually, it's a cheese grater body with uh, vegetable steamers added to either top, and then we just added for a little decoration. Um, the, the finishing touch was the incense burners, and these were all electrified, and they were all throughout Cairo, in the tavern, in the bar. And when you put them next to the other ones, they just all kind of blended right in, and that was the fun part about this whole thing, because there's a little something in every set. One of the Cairo background people is going to be carrying this little, this little bin on their heads. And in the movie, I bet a lot of people are just going to see this walk by and they're going to understand that, okay, it's somebody carrying a bunch of stuff on their head. But when you look at this, it's, it's just full of goldfish crackers. So if there are those folks out there that, that post these things on the internet saying, hey, we caught you, you used a cheese grater, you're going to be up all night long with the DVD on this one because there's just hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of things that are in there just for them to find. <laughs> We wanted to create a believable location that existed in Mount Rushmore that in some ways topped, you know, James Bond caves and, and was the most amazing place we could think of. All of these pieces of Mount Rushmore open up to allow these vehicles, which are sort of standard uh, army vehicles that we've redesigned and retrofitted with Team America's Zippy graphic program. And they land in this large building that feels like a crater inside of, of Mount Rushmore. And within that crater, there's a small, beautiful, modernist house that sits perched up on the waterfall that, um, that is the swankiest. It's kind of, you know, the Rat Pack meets the, the absolute epitome of what modern architecture is right now. And they sit in swanky furniture and, and drink martinis from this waterfall bar. But since that's so high style and so designed, a lot of those are real duplications of actual furniture. The Arnie Jacobson chair, the egg chair, um, that's in there. So that we have some real classic contemporary furniture that we just designed down to scale and matched it exactly. And we built the pool table from scratch. It's beautiful. It's the most coveted thing as far as I'm concerned. And it's just, we wanted a place that celebrated space and the luxury of it. And um, one room we did um, spend a lot of money on and, and in was Lisa's bedroom. But unfortunately, I don't think anybody <laughs> is going to be looking at any of the decoration in her bedroom. We have the, you know, the distant mountains that you see lit up but there's also candles behind her bed, small candles in the foreground, and all of those things that the net sum of them is this really luscious place, perfect for puppet sex. I cannot believe that I actually have a Chechnin standing here telling me when he's gonna take a delivery! Hello? Perhaps we can be ready sooner. Yes, perhaps you can. Tim Jong-il is a fabulous character. We're in love with the location. Um, we did a lot of research into what Kim Jong-il's world really looked like, which is pretty out there. And it, he is a pretty eccentric guy in terms of his taste. 
only in the last year have lots and lots of photos emerged from North Korea. So we went through anything we could find that showed us what it looked like in uh, Pyongyang in North Korea. And we modeled our sets after Kim Jong-il's palaces, uh, the shapes and the patterns and the marble and the bad disco lighting and the ridiculous little fountains, this combination of kind of Liberace, you know, dictator chic. When you first see his, his palace up on the hill with all of the poor suburbs below it, which are made out of Chinese food containers, you get the sense of this kind of amazing, eccentric world. And when you get into it, um, it, it has a very, very bizarre use of color and ornament. And it really is about his perception of himself. There's portraits of him everywhere, but it's this huge palace with this little strange person moving through it in, in a color scheme that really picks up on what sort of North Korea looks like and what Kim Jong-il's world looks like. Very researched. A really great David Rockwell influence was really adding pop color and a heavy pop sensibility. That's, that's what he's known for, you know, vibrant colors and, uh, and really, really pushing the envelope with his found objects. You know, missiles hanging from lanterns, uh, grenades hanging from chandeliers, all over the place. Three, two, one, explosion! The Panama Canal um, is essentially an, an action sequence where the Panama Canal is flooded. So we're creating this backdrop for this action scene. It is this kind of acidy, strange yellow that we found in research from the Panama Canal. And if you'll notice, the, all of the foliage surrounding it is all made out of pot. You know, it wants to feel like a dangerous place. And so we've done it with, uh, you know, color and uh, a lot of pot. Because of the job that the art department's done, because of the set decorator, because of the wardrobe, because of the puppeteers, there's so much happening in this film. And all the guys that I work with agree that this is probably the best movie we will ever work on in our careers. And it makes me a little sad to say that, because I hopefully still have a, a big career ahead of me, but I also realize that this kind of a thing is not likely to happen again anytime soon, unless, of course, we can do a sequel. Sequel.